124 Payload Manager, Scott Higginbotham. Scott, thank you for joining us. Great to be here today. We, uh, you're going to kind of walk us through what, uh, what we're going to see, actually what is not seen now, but we'll be seeing when we open the, the payload bay doors uh, uh, and get to the space station. Um, but first, I think we've got a uh, couple of pictures of uh, what's going on out at the launch pad. It uh, may uh, make you a little nostalgic, I guess, right? Oh, indeed it does. Uh, back uh, early in my career here with NASA in the late 80s, early 90s, I used to be a member of what was called the ICE team. Now it's the final inspection team. And so uh, I miss being out there uh, when I see those guys out there doing that uh, walk around. It's a pretty amazing spectacle to be out there under the vehicle as it's uh, starting to come to life. And uh, they, they started out uh, this morning at the 255-foot level, moved to the 215 level. The 195 level, which is where, of course, the crew enters the shuttle. They move then to the 135-foot level, and right now they wrap up at the very bottom level, the or zero level of the mobile launcher platform, and they are uh, doing their final inspections there, and should be reporting out in about half an hour or so. But that's what's going on in the pad, and uh, they're not working any any issues right now that uh, would prevent us from lifting off at 5.02 p.m. today. So, Scott, if you wouldn't mind, um, we've got a shot of the aft end of Discovery. And uh, if you go up a little higher, you can, we can see the cargo bay. And why don't we talk about what's inside there? We have an absolutely amazing spacecraft that we're going to be taking up to the International Space Station, the uh, JAXA's uh, pressurized module, uh, part of the Kibo system. It's the largest uh, pressurized component of the International Space Station and uh, just truly a remarkable machine. It's uh it really will increase the scientific capability on board the station, and it's so big. I'm supposed to say, how big is it? It's so big that it takes three flights to be able to take up entirely. Uh, and uh, what other international partners back uh, reduce the size of modules, including the U.S. laboratory. Um, Japanese laboratory pretty much stayed really close to the 20-year-old design, is my understanding. Indeed, it did. Um, they stuck with their original plan. They were going to be the smallest, and now they're the largest. <laughs> And it has. Uh, I'm sure we'll actually, we'll walk through it. So why don't we? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get out of the way and let you. Let you do your thing. Okay. Very good. Uh, if we can go ahead and show the uh, the video, then this tries to uh, compress uh, what ended up taking about five years into about six minutes. The uh, Kibo module arrived at the Kennedy Space Center from Japan in late May of 2003. It arrived by ship. It left Yokohama, Japan on the 2nd of May of 2003 and took 28 days to come across the Pacific Ocean through the Panama Canal and up to uh, Port Canaveral. We unloaded all of the hardware at the Navy facilities at Port Canaveral. As you can see, they have a rather massive crane there that was uh, very convenient for our use. Um, the element came off actually five days after the ship arrived because first we had to get off all the ground support equipment necessary to support that module when it arrived at the SSPF and get it assembled. And primarily the uh, large rotation stand that the element has sat in during its campaign here. It then came via truck over to the space station processing facility where we got it out of its shipping container, as you can see here. You can actually see the old, uh, what uh the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, its older name, NASDA. Right. While the element was here, they uh, changed their name from NASDA to JAXA. And so there's still some vestiges of that uh, old agency's logo that you can see around the place. So once the element uh, arrived, we did get it uh, into its uh, rotation stand so that the Japanese technicians could begin their work preparing the module for flight. The module came a little earlier than it really needed to in order to meet up with the Node 2 Harmony module. As they uh, mate together on orbit, it was uh, decided early on in the program that it would make a lot of sense to try to join the two together, at least electrically, to ensure that all of those interfaces were going to work right before we uh, put the hardware up into space. So uh, shortly after the module arrived, we did perform what we called our multi-element integrated tests, and that was in August and September of 2003. And in that test, we also used a simulator of the U.S. laboratory, again, to make sure everything was going to work right on orbit. What you're seeing here now is uh, a scene of some of the Japanese technicians working on the windows of the module. Uh, the Kibo has two very large windows that look out over the uh, where the exposed uh, facility hardware will be after the last flight, STS-127. 
And uh, during the course of the flow, there were a wide variety of tasks that uh, that JAXA performed, and uh, some that we actually assisted with, and others we provided uh, advice and uh, and support items for JAXA. And over the course of the flow, they installed all of the racks into the module and tested them, not only the racks that are flying up on this mission, the four, but uh, seven others that are uh, waiting on orbit for Kibo once it arrives. The flight crew came down numerous times during the campaign, and here they are during their last visit in January of this year. Um, they like to come down and, and actually touch the flight hardware when they can to practice uh, some of the tools and techniques that they'll use during the flight. Finally, after all the work was done on the 22nd of April of this year, we lifted the element one last time and weighed it. The module weighs in at 32,220 pounds and 12 ounces. <laughs> and here it is being translated over for installation into our transportation canister, which we use to keep the module dry and cool during the uh, ride from the industrial area here at the Kennedy Space Center out to the launch pad. This is a very slow and methodical operation, and it, what you're seeing here actually took place over the course of about six hours. And there it is, just getting ready to set down. You can get a scale for how large the module is, as that canister is essentially the same size as the orbiter payload bay. There's Dr. Tanaka, our local resident manager for GEM Project. We rotated the canister to vertical, and then on the 29th of April, we departed for pad A. The journey out to the pad takes about three hours to complete. We go very slow to avoid inducing any vibrations in the spacecraft. And we typically go uh, uh, during a time of day where weather is cooperative for us, and uh, in the time of year that we went out here in April, Early evening was a good time to go, so you can see us approaching sunset. We take the payload elements to the pad before the space shuttle vehicle arrives. That allows us to get in place and, uh, and get our canister out of the way long before the, uh, the shuttle shows up so that we don't uh, perturb the critical path for the launch vehicle preparations. And there you can see our transporter going up the incline, just like the, uh, the crawler that carries the shuttle to the pad, our, our transporter can adjust to accommodate that, uh, that tilt as it goes up the ramp. Once we get to the pad, the canister is actually hoisted up into the rotating service structure of the pad. Inside that rotating service structure is a room called the payload changeout room, and inside that room is a five-story gantry called the payload ground, ground handling mechanism that picks the payload element up out of the canister and takes it back into the pad structure. Once that's complete, the canister is lowered and taken away. And then we wait for the vehicle to arrive. In this case, we waited about a week. The uh, discovery came to the pad on the 5th of May. And then that large structure that you see there now rotates around the space shuttle the payload bay doors are opened, and the uh, element is installed into the payload bay of the orbiter. And there is what the PM looked like after we had installed it into the orbiter and had pulled all the platforms back. That was after we did all of our electrical uh, mates and tests and our final closeouts, final assembly operations. And uh, this is as the doors closed for flight on May 10th. Um, several of my colleagues and I were there to, uh, to kiss the hardware goodbye. The next time we'll see it will be tonight, hopefully, when we get on orbit, when it's um, circling the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. That's a, that's a good time to see it again. <laughs> Indeed it is. And uh, that brings us to where we are right about now. and It's at uh, about 22 minutes left in this built-in T-minus three-hour hold, and we're getting very close now where the uh, Discovery's astronauts will be suiting up and getting ready to uh, head out to the launch pad themselves. Wonderful. Well, Scott, any, uh, I appreciate you coming by and walking us through what, uh, what's inside and what's, what, what is this whole cargo about and, uh, and uh, giving us a little extra information about the final inspection team. Learn something new about you every day. <laughs> well, thanks. It's a pleasure being here. We're all excited on this uh, very historic day for uh, the Japanese space program and 
And uh, for us, it's been a real privilege and an honor to work alongside them as they've 